following podcast contains graphic content that may be disturbing or triggering to some listeners. Discretion is advised. The Papa Tango Delta Sierra podcast is available free of charge thanks to the support of Cracked Armor. Their mission is to raise awareness for PTSD, TBI, and mental health to support those who struggle. By creating an army of warriors who represent the gear, their hope is that it will send the message to others that they are not alone. Go to CrackedArmor.com, say hi to Mark Long, read about the story, find some research information about PTSD, and support the cause by buying some gear. Ten nine. Did you say Papa Tango Sierra Delta? Ten four. There's so much left to do, so many things I wanna say and I say. Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away. Welcome to episode five of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. My name is Larry Payton, and I have been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress. Welcome back to the show. I appreciate your tuning in. I appreciate your interest. This episode is going to be a continuation on from the last one, during which I was speaking with Jason Sobkowicz, a constable with the Ontario Provincial Police. Jason talked about a traumatic event that occurred some panic attacks that he's had, nightmares, stigmas within the police culture, having to step back from work, and his ongoing battle with complex post-traumatic stress. Before we commence with that, I will share a little bit more information about me. Last week, I was a guest on the 911 Strong podcast out of California. At that time, it was shared who I work and my years of service, so I reckon it's only fair to share it here as well. At the end of this month, I will be starting my 22nd year of policing, all of which has been with the RCMP. I'm originally from Newf. Of course, I did training in Saskatchewan, did a couple of postings in Alberta, did a posting in Ontario, and am now in Nova Scotia. I was asked on the 911 Strong podcast how often I wore the red surge. My answer was not very often. Well, not anymore. I used to wear it quite a bit, especially in my first posting. Of course, I would attend every Remembrance Day ceremony in my dress uniform and wear it with pride. And thereafter, to the Legion, to talk to some of the veterans, including one that I've lost a while ago, Charlie, World War II vet, absolutely amazing man. I've also attended a number of Calgary Flames games, standing on the ice to hold one of the flags during the opening national anthems. I was there as well for, I think it was Game 4, of the Stanley Cup playoffs when the Flames were playing the Tampa Bay Lightning. And you get the opportunity at that point to meet Don Cherry and Ron McLean. It's pretty fun. But most times when I wore my red surge, it was for regimental funerals. I had about eight months service when I attended the first one for Superintendent Massey. I was in Calgary in 2002. I'll never forget it. It was bitterly cold. Just standing there with a light shirt on under my red tunic. In a line with a lot of members, standing tall, standing proud, ensuring to stand there with full respect and condolences for the family of the deceased. It's one of these things that just doesn't leave you. It was the first regimental funeral I attended. Two years later, I attended one for Corporal Galloway. That was in 2004. Corporal Galloway was in Sherwood Park when he lost his life. That one really hit home. I don't know why. I was a junior constable, two-year service, but man... It just resonated with me and stuck with me. And not just the funeral, but, you know, working night shifts, being alone in the PC. Just couldn't stop thinking about him. A year later, I wore my red surge again for the four members who were gunned down in Mayerthorpe, Alberta. Yeah, that one as well, I will always remember. It was a huge regimental funeral. It was amazing being inside the Butter Dome for the ceremonies, but it was also very, very sad and emotional. I know I teared up. I said a lot of other members that were there. What hit home with that was, I mean, these were all junior members. I mean, I felt like I had a lot in common with them. Small town in Alberta. First posting. That one left a scar. 
That one really hurt. While I was posted in Nova Scotia, the instance in Moncton occurred. And I feel shame in saying this, but I couldn't go. I just couldn't. I felt broken. I felt depleted. I felt tired. I just couldn't muster the strength to go. It had been a while since I wore my red serge for a regimental funeral, but I just couldn't go to Moncton. Again, fairly junior members, one of them whom was in my big brother troop, so we were at depot at the same time. Knew him. I just couldn't go. I don't regret it to this day, but just there's such a heaviness on my chest and my shoulders about it. And then most recently was a mass shooting in Nova Scotia when we lost Constable Stevenson. I couldn't go to that one either. But I knew her. And I couldn't muster the strength to go. By that time, I was broken. I'll get into what broke me at some other show, but I was broken. I will say that I did put on my red surge for Heidi. I wore it with honor and respect. I just couldn't leave my own home. I was affected too much. I just felt debilitated. So... To get back to the 911 Strong podcast, do I wear the scarlet tunic very often? No. Every time I look at it now, it unfortunately brings back a lot of bad memories, a lot of sadness, a lot of pain. I'm very proud to wear it, but it just seems to always be such a weight on me. Let's step away from that and talk about something a little lighter. If you're enjoying this show, do me a favor. Reach out to Mark Long of Cracked Armor. Just tell him thanks for supporting the show. Mark was a troop mate of mine. His bunk was just across from mine. He took good care of me at depot, and I hope I did the same for him. Just reach out and say thanks. I'm sure it'll do good that he knows how much his support is appreciated. Speaking of Mark, this weekend, uh, March 10th to 12th, 2023, in case you're listening to this some other time, I will be at the Sports and RV Show at the Halifax Exhibition Center. I'll be in the Cracked Armor booth with Mark talking about the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast and hopefully helping other people who are struggling in silence and spread the word about the show. I'll end with a little bit of an introspection I've done regarding my post-traumatic stress injuries. I find that there's a lot of people who can't accept something is real in the sense that something that is real, they pretend it isn't. And I feel PTSD is one of those things. Jason spoke about it on the last episode. Some of the stigmas that are there. That he didn't have much support from his brothers and sisters. As I mentioned before, I wonder if they're actually struggling themselves. And as such, something they know is real, they're pretending it's not. One of the other things I think about as well is that in the military and first responder world, we spend a lot of time seeking permission. For example, you need permission to take vacation time. You need permission to make a purchase for the unit. You need permission to do overtime. So we spend a lot of time seeking permission. And I feel that bleeds over into our mental health. And the reality is, you should never need permission to take care of you and your health. So if you're struggling, don't seek permission. You shouldn't need to. Talk to your doctor, see a psychologist, or just step back and take a break. But you do not, and you should never, need permission to take care of you and your health. Let's take a quick break. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you have experience with post-traumatic stress and would like to join me for an episode, please reach out to me. You can contact me via direct message on Instagram, PTSD underscore podcast. Or you can send me an email at Papa Tango Sierra Delta Podcast at gmail.com. Cheers. This episode of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta Podcast is brought to you thanks to the support and financial sponsorship of Cracked Armor. Go to CrackedArmor.com, read the story, buy the gear, wear it to send the message to others who are struggling that they're not alone. Also to Willow Tree Firms, care of Jason Sobkowicz, another member who is struggling with PTSD 
and who updates his Instagram frequently to share his story. You can follow him at jason.sobkowicz. So we're just back from the break. Thank you very much for sticking around and staying tuned in to the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. Joined by Jason Sobkowicz of the OPP. This is part two of my conversation with Jason. We're going to get into, we, we kind of ended a little abruptly on the last one. And I sort of want to get back into talking about your issues as things happen regarding tattoos. And where you are today with the PTSD diagnosis and your time away from work. Yeah, we kind of teased a little bit. The truth is, I'm going to have to be pretty careful with what I say. However... This is all public knowledge. This was arbitrated in a uh, court of law. It made national headlines across Canada, and anybody can go and look this stuff up. So it's not like I'm going to be providing evidence for anything. It's just that everything is really political now, and I don't want to get caught up in something that's a political shitstorm. However, I do have a pretty cool story about tattoos in the policing world. And I mean, if I had my 10 minutes or my 15 minute claim to fame, this might be one of them. <laughs> it's not a bad one. I mean, I am a person who tends to be very much against tattoos. <laughs> Covered them. <laughs> yeah. <sounds> like it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell yeah. us, man. Give us the background. Give us the story. Yeah, I'm a guy that has lots of tattoos. When I first got hired by the OPP in 2005 as a cadet, I had tattoos that were visible with a short sleeve uniform on. Didn't matter. I mean, that was the spirit of the times, you know, tattoos became popular again sometime in the 90s, mid 90s, I think. And they kind of exploded into the mainstream and, you know, going forward into the early 2000s or the early 2010s even. I think the stats were something like 40 percent of Canadians had at least one tattoo. Well, wow. yeah. And I mean, tattoos go back thousands of years. They go back farther than we probably even know. I mean, that frozen ice man that was located remember that story there was a caveman that was located they actually found like a lot of this human's body intact he had tattoos no i did not know that listen they had to be old school tattoos oh yeah we're talking <laughs> like a sharpened piece of bone and, a, yeah. and some coloring from a flower or something who knows but i mean tattoos have been in human culture for millennia let's just say that so we get hired as a police officer i've got some tattoos i get a whole bunch more as my policing career progresses Fast forward to, I think it was 2009. At the time, we had uh, Commissioner Chris Lewis. He was running the helm. He and a couple of the deputy commissioners within the OPP, these were a bit old school guys. They were probably gentlemen that were born in the 50s, and they grew up looking at tattoos a certain way. They had an opinion about it. Fair enough. In 2009, after 100 years of the OPP policing Ontario, they decided to create policy surrounding visible tattoos on police officers while on duty. A little late. Yeah, I mean, 100 years later, people had been getting hired for decades with visible tattoos, tattoos on the neck, tattoos on the forearm, tattoos on the hands. This is decades old stuff. I mean, you've got a lot of ex-military guys coming out of World War II that ended up getting jobs in the OPP. They had tattoos everywhere. You had guys that I worked with, that I grew up with, who were way more tattooed than me that had jobs in the OPP. And then nobody ever batted an eye. I mean, tattoos weren't even spoken about. Anyhow, so in 2009, a policy change occurs within the OPP. And this tattoo policy comes into play and it says that if you have tattoos that are visible to the public and they're offensive, you have to cover them up. Fine. That sounds really good. I agree with that 100%. Yep, I'm, I'm sure with you it. would too, Larry. I'm with it. Absolutely. I'm thinking about some of the old school, like where there's like a really fucking shitty portrait of like a naked female on your arm. Yeah, you know, like the old school pinup girl that her privates are exposed. I understand wanting to cover that up. There's people that would be offended by that. Or if you've got a tattoo of like a marijuana leaf or some silly thing you did in the 70s when you're an idiot. Yeah, okay, cover it up, right? Yep, yep exactly. So the tattoo policy sounded pretty cool, except there was a little tiny caveat a little catch-all that they put in that. And the language read, a tattoo may be deemed offensive if the detachment commander, through information provided by the general public, finds that the tattoos were subjectively offensive. Okay, whoa. So that right there, yeah, whoa. that right there was the Trojan horse of the entire policy. Yeah, that makes it completely subjective. Yeah, the whole policy before that, up until that point, the whole policy read like, yeah, okay, that sounds great. They kind of listed out what offensive tattoos would be, 
you know, things that violated the criminal code, things that were offensive because of their ethnic origin or they depicted criminal activity. Yeah, I get that. That's cool, man. But to say that a detachment commander could use his or her subjective discretion to say your tattoos were offensive, that was, like I said, it was the Trojan horse. It was the gray area that was a little bit disturbing. However, in 2009, when this tattoo policy was enacted in the fall, nobody cared. Nobody said anything. Not one person in the OPP organization was affected by it. And I'll tell you that I know this now. To this day, not one time ever in the history of the OPP had a member of the public ever once came forward to complain about an officer's tattoos. We're talking about the second or third largest police force in Canada, and they had never in 100 years had a complaint about a tattoo. So we fast forward to 2010. I'm on duty one day short sleeves, it's summertime, it's about 95 degrees outside, and I'm out doing my job, I have a vehicle pulled over at a traffic stop, and I remember, because of the incident, I remember I was giving this young lad a little bit of a tongue lashing for not wearing a seatbelt. Little did I know that a detective inspector uh, working for our uh, CIB, which is our criminal investigation branch, he drove by me in his own detective car. I didn't know. He goes to the detachment and he says to my detachment commander, I just drove by an officer who looks like a gangbanger who stole a cop car. You need to tell that cop to cover up his tattoos. Fuck off. So my detachment commander, using the Trojan horse clause in the tattoo policy, hits me up on the radio, Constable Subquitch, can you please return to detachment and speak to the detachment commander? Yep. I'm thinking, what the hell? I go there and he says, I have to order you to cover your tattoos up. And I, I was just taken aback, like, what? And I said this. I said, what do you mean? I don't have offensive tattoos. And he explained to me, this detective inspector said I looked like a gang member driving a police car around because of my visible tattoos. I have on my left arm, I have tattoos down to my wrist. And on my right arm, I have tattoos down to my wrist. And my right arm has a portrait of my grandfather that says, Papa, my hero. And on opposite of that, on the other side of my forearm is a 1961 Chevy Sport Coupe with some song lyrics that my grandfather sang to me as a child. Both very, very gang-oriented tattoos. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, very detrimental to society, right? <laughs> on my left arm, I've been involved in martial arts for about 25 years. So on my left arm, I have a symbol of traditional artwork that would have come from China. So I have a food dog or the Lion of Buddha. And surrounded by um, trees and water and, and, a, and in the background, there's some mountains and a traditional um, Chinese temple. So, I mean, from far away, my tattoos just look like color, but up close, there's nothing offensive in any way about them, unless you would be offended by my grandfather or traditional Chinese artwork. Right. So I tried to argue my case, but uh, ultimately the detachment commander had his say. My association got involved. They said I didn't have to listen to this order because it was arbitrary and a violation of my human rights. However, when you're given an order by a ranking member, a senior ranking member, it doesn't matter if you think he's right or wrong. You still have to follow his order and then go through the due process of determining whether he's right or wrong. So I was told, yes, okay, this policy may be a violation, but if you don't listen to me, I'm going to have you charged with insubordination. <laughs> So where do I go, right? Wow. I mean, every yeah. day I show up for work, I'm going to be charged with insubordination. And yet I still have to fight this and wait. So I had to cover up my tattoos for a period of two and a half years. Well, wow. I put an official grievance for the OPP said, no way. We will not bow down to this. We will not alter course. The tattoo policy stays. So the association's legal team got involved and the lawyer phoned me and said, hey, do you really want to proceed with this? And I said, yeah, I do. I mean, this is on sort of like first principles. This is morally and ethically violating how I feel. I, I was hired this way. I'm not a gangbanger. I'm a policeman, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So we proceeded with a court case and it was two and a half years. I was flown to Toronto, to the Mississauga area. On two separate occasions, we had a couple of weeks of testimony in court before a judge. And, well, at the end of it, our lawyer was able to win the case. And the case was won not on whether or not a tattoo violates a human right. The case was won that chiefs of police and commissioners of police cannot arbitrarily and subjectively create policy that would otherwise be harmful or detrimental to the force for no other reason than its subjective reasons. 
So it kind of really hamstrings chiefs of police across Canada because now a judge had just committed to saying you don't have that much power. You cannot subjectively create policy because of how you feel. And what we learned was normally when a large change to our police orders was going to happen, our commissioner and their commissioner's committee would take that change, present it to our association body to ensure that the members wouldn't be so grievously harmed by it that it would create this problem in the first place, right? They would look at it and make sure that the policy itself wasn't harmful, that it was beneficial, and that the transition into the new policy wasn't going to be grievous for everybody involved in it, right? Well, that actually had not been done in this case, probably because they knew the association would never go for it. So they basically backdoored this policy in because they knew that it was very subjective and based completely in their own minds. It had no bearing on public opinion or public complaint at all. I mean, that information all came forward. I'm going to backtrack to 2010 when the lawyer phoned me to do the initial interview and start the uh, court case rolling. And I'll never forget this, Larry. The lawyer who had represented our association for about 30 years at the time, so he was a very senior lawyer, he said to me, quote, this is career suicide. I just want you to know that. Jesus Christ. And, you know, I'm young. At this time, I only had five or six years on the job, but career suicide, what could that possibly mean? Yeah, yeah. Do you still want to proceed? This is career suicide, Jay. You're going up against the highest ranking commissioner next to the RCMP's commissioner in all of the nation. And I just couldn't let it go because this is who I was. And Larry, you know this. My tattoos had been a positive conversation piece on the job and had never once been detrimental in me executing my duties. I mean, I had kids come up to me. Oh, my God, look at your cool tattoos. I had older people that would come up to me. Oh, my God. Look at the tattooing. Why would you do that? But they would be curious. It never caused any harm. So fast forward to the conclusion of this court case. It's now summer of 2012, two and a half years, almost three years since the policy has been created. We win the court case. And all I hear in, the he in my head is this is career suicide. And remember I said early on that my goal was to expand my career. I wanted to be on the ERT team. I wanted to get into SWAT or, you know, our elite track tactics and rescue unit. I I wanted to do something with my life. Well, career suicide was an understatement. Fuck. Because the amount of bullying and harassment that I endured coming from the high-ranking command staff was just insane, Larry. And this is where, unfortunately, I'm going to have to come back to you at another podcast when I can legally promote and articulate all of the things that I would love to say right now. But I'll just say that in the nine years since that decision was handed down, I have more than 50 unfounded internal complaints against me that were all absolute bullshit in an attempt to ruin my career. Holy fuck. Yeah. And you know, the only thing I can say in the truth of the matter is that decision took a lot of authority and power away from chiefs of police across Canada. It made headlines. You can just Google OPP tattoo policy court case, and you'll see Every major newspaper from the east to the west coast ran the story for a while because every single police association across Canada now had to deal with any grievance coming forward was going to be levied against whether or not the chief of police or the commissioner had the actual management rights to do so. So you can imagine how detrimental this was to the power and authority that a commissioner or a chief of police would have over its own members, right? Yeah. And Trust me when I say this was not what I had hoped to get out of my court case. I'd hoped for them to get rid of the Trojan horse clause in the tattoo policy and leave us alone, those of us whose tattoos weren't considered offensive. What ended up happening was much more major. And I wore that. I've been wearing that ever since. And it has been absolute hell. And it has also probably been a very serious mitigating factor in why my trauma and the depression and anxiety experience has been exacerbated for so many years is because I've had to fight to defend myself against fraudulent claims levied against me because I fought the highest ranking member of my police force. Seems to be a case where there was a lot of upset individuals that you won the battle that were going to make sure that you were ultimately going to lose the war. Yeah. And uh, you know what? I get this question asked to me once in a while, and it's, oh, it is such an existential debate in my head. Would I do it again? Yeah, that's deep. Because I have missed out on opportunities to promote. I've missed out on opportunities to specialize. 
I've missed out on training. I've had no career development. In my 18 years of policing, I have been sent to one specialized training course after asking for years to further my career development. And I'm telling you that there's no evidence whatsoever on display within my force to say why I shouldn't have had any career development other than this thing followed me. This career suicide has been following me ever since this court case and has snowballed into this ideal that I'm the scapegoat and I'm the guy that gets punished for everything because this is what I did to the OPP and its policy holders and its policy makers. It's been a real profound challenge in my career. And I have a list a mile long of almost, I think it's up to 50 unfounded complaints against me, highly detailed and currently in a official grievance before my police force. And so, like I said, On another podcast, Larry, I'll let you know when I can really expose the details so we can have a real close dive in to see just how badly members can be treated when somebody's ego gets in the way. But it's been a fucking ride, man. It's been hell. Yeah, I would say it's been been a ride. Fuck. Because I'm at the constable level with 18 years on, and I've got the same amount of specialized training as a rookie. Wow. I don't even know what to fucking say to that. Wow. I have the same specialized course load as somebody who just attended police college. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. Fuck. Yeah, it's been a struggle and a grind. It has definitely negatively enhanced my mental health struggles because it's really, really given me a feeling of worthlessness when, you know, for so many years I was cut down behind my back where I would have a supervisor telling me all this great stuff about how I am. You're doing great, Jay. You're, I see you as a leader. Your uh, defensive tactic skills are awesome. You're great at talking to people. You have good wherewithal. And communication skills, you know, my annual review, always great, always good, always recommending me for this or that. For a while, I wanted to specialize as a detective, shut right down. I was recommended on three separate occasions for promotion to the rank of sergeant, shut down every time. I put my name in for every single specialized training course I could think of, shot down every single time. And so going back to 2010, when that lawyer said this is career suicide, He knew after 30 years of representing police members that fighting high-ranking officers was career suicide. Not because that's what you hear in the movies, because that's the real-world reality of what happens if you're a constable and you're trying to fight a higher-ranking member in a police force. Yeah. I'm looking at something the Star wrote with regards to this, and I just want to highlight some things before we move off, and we don't want to talk anymore about what can potentially cause some issues for you, so... We'll move on oh, from that, <laughs> but uh, I just want to say it appears that the commissioner, the OPP commissioner at the time was Chris Lewis, and there's a quote in here from Chris Lewis that says, all you have to do is watch a movie with Mike Tyson and see what could be. That's just not the image we want to portray. Um, wow. I mean, that says a lot right there. And then you move a little bit further and it says the constable at the heart of the dispute had a large tattoo of the face of his grandfather on the inside of his left arm as a memorial. It's fucking ludicrous. Like, I'm not really sure this old school thought of, well, if you have a tattoo, I mean, I'm okay with old school thoughts. Look, fuck, man, I can be guilty of fucking old school thoughts too. There's no doubt. I mean, I've got two kids. I mean, they're growing up now, but fuck yeah, I'm guilty of old school thoughts. But hold the fuck on a second. I mean, I don't change policy based on old school thoughts. I don't fucking think, you know, I mean, there was, was a time that bad guys had tattoos. And I mean, that was me growing up. If you had a tattoo, it's like, well, my fuck, what is this guy? Holy fuck, he must have been in jail or something. But that changed, like you said, in the early 90s, for fuck's sakes. And uh, it's come to a point that it's no longer a pick and stick. It's all about custom artwork. They're considered very expensive art pieces that give an individual the opportunity to be an individual, to be themselves, to be who they want to be. And when you're talking about the tattoos you have, I don't fucking understand how you go from a memorial for your grandfather to being mistaken for, quote, a gangbanger. That's fucked. Dude, I almost want to fucking laugh because I can only say that's like uber fucked. That's fucked as fucked gets. Like, what? If only you could have been a fly on the wall during the court case, Larry. I'll tell you one thing. I'll share this because court case is recorded in an FOI. A Freedom of Information can get all of this. This has nothing to do with my personal grievance. During trial, during the actual trial, I take the stand. And the OPP's lawyer, the one that's attempting to cause me to say something or do something so that they can win their case, he's examining me now. 
this lawyer doesn't even know that I was told that I looked like a gangbanger. They didn't even know that that language was used to belittle me. So I'm sitting in the court, the lawyer for the OPP, for the commissioner, he's standing there and he asks me to explain the day that I was ordered to cover up. And I explain this to him. And he stops me and he says, excuse me, officer, I don't have any evidence to support that high ranking member called you a gangbanger and said you looked like you stole a police car. So my lawyer stood up and said, I'd like to uh, present the legal team again with the information I submitted in disclosure. Here's the letter from Constable Subkowich's detachment commander, where he states literally in the complaint letter, I ordered Constable Subkowich to cover up his tattoos because a detective inspector said he looked like a gangbanger and I didn't want the public to have the same perception. This wasn't made up. This was legally written down by the detachment commander who ordered me to cover up. And yet the OPP's lawyer had no knowledge whatsoever that that was even part of it. And then it gets even better. And then this is like, I had to hold off on laughing and screaming in anger at the same time. The OPP calls up one of their star witnesses. She was a civilian, high, very high ranking member of the OPP. And she was a wonderful woman. She was a very integral part of the OPP. And I'm, I can't remember her name, unfortunately, but she was as high ranking as a civilian in the OPP as you can get. She takes the stand. And during examination, she explains that if she was lost in the woods, frightened for her life, and a police officer was approaching her to rescue her, and she observed that the officer had a tattoo or tattoos, she would run farther into the bush to get away. She would be so frightened by that cop. Now you tell me, Larry, what human being on planet Earth, what one, sitting out in the forest, terrified for their life, waiting for rescue to show up, and they see a police saying, I'm here to rescue you, police uniform on, they've been missing, they've either called the police or somebody did saying they're missing, and now you're going to look at that person, see a, a tattoo or tattoos and run away farther and make yourself more susceptible to death? And that was the key that their whole case hinged on, was that I was going to frighten people away. That was what the witnesses said out loud. I was just like I said, I was trying to hold back screaming and anger and laughing at the same time during this court case. Yeah. I think if you're anywhere and you're terrified about your life and someone's there to save you, I would be surprised if they could fucking tell you anything about the person, let alone their tattoos, because you're fucking yeah. genuinely scared for your life. It doesn't even make any fucking sense. Exactly. It's very, very odd. It just seems like a whole lot of horseshit. And unfortunately, I mean, yeah, it seems to be one of these things where... You know, I'll go back to your key fucking phrase, career suicide. What happens afterwards without getting into the stuff you can't get into? Or, I mean, you're struggling with PTSD big time. And I use the term struggling lightly, big time. You're fucking struggling to the point that you're rushing yourself to the hospital in a cruiser. You're going through the tattoo issue. You're getting pushed back. PTSD is fucking horrible enough when it comes to support because there really is, if anything, a minuscule amount. And that's arguable. And now you're actually the complete opposite of support. You're being, well, shunned because you won an argument based upon doing what you, and obviously a lot of members believe is genuinely the right thing. And that's what we're taught to do. That's what we're supposed to do is what's right. Yeah. You know, how does that fast forward to today? What's, what the fuck is going on? You know, how has this affected your PTSD? What's happening, brother? I mean, it was all coming together at the same time. So the two and a half years where I was going through this court case were very stressful for their own reasons, right? I mean, uh, I was constantly having to do disclosure. I was interviewed multiple times by multiple lawyers. I was going to and from Toronto for court hearings. And there were members of the detachment I worked at that were not in support of me. And then on top of that, I had to cover up. So in the summertime, Larry, I had to wear tattoo sleeve covers, these neoprene pull-on covers that would ride up my arm to my shoulder. That was worse than the tattoos, man. People were like, why are you wearing those? What are you doing with those things on? It's 90 degrees outside. How come you're wearing a long sleeve shirt when it's 100 Fahrenheit? I'm more likely to run away from that person than I am from the tattooed person. Yeah, like the weirdo who's trying to make himself hotter, right? Eh? <laughs> yeah, like what the fuck? Yeah, so I mean, the two and a half years leading up to the court decision were stressful enough. And then court decision happened. The incident that initially caused my PTSD symptoms to manifest happened about six or eight months later. So I was already kind of on the tipping point of stress. 
you know, because this decision had come down. Some things weren't adding up at the detachment anymore. I didn't have the same sort of, oh, what's the word I'm trying to look for? I felt like I wasn't even being paid attention to by certain members of the detachment anymore. And right at the same time that this was happening, there were a couple of detectives and the detective sergeant who had been, you know, the term grooming. You've heard that before. I wanted into the crime office. I, I was pretty keen on being a detective. I had just finished a one-year secondment into our local crime unit that worked on some pretty big criminal cases, including a homicide and a great big arson. And so I was, I really liked it and I was working, but the detective sergeant was dead set against this tattoo thing. And he thought I should never have opened my mouth, that it was just shut up and do. You don't get to have a voice. You're not allowed to say, you know, like ours is into question why, ours is to do and die. Isn't that the old military saying? Yeah, right. Well, there's some old school guys that are in the police forces that still believe that. That doesn't matter what the policy says. You just shut the fuck up and you do exactly what they say. And so he didn't like that I spoke up and had a voice. So my opportunity to become a detective in the crime unit was completely shut down. 100%. I went from, yeah, we want you in. We're grooming you. There's an interview process that's going to be coming up in a year. We think it's yours. I studied. I fucking wanted it, man. I really put an effort into it completely shot down. It's been a ride. And that has really been detrimental to my, my mental health. Well, fuck, I guess so. Jesus, you're already fucking struggling, Jason. Like you're already struggling. And then this. Yeah. So I didn't have much left. If I was treading water, dude, the only thing that was out of the water was my fucking mouth. Yeah. Like for several years, I was just coming to work and hanging on tight, dude. I was able to get it done because I was fueled by adrenaline. It was the only thing that really kicked me into gear. Yeah was I was fueled by the adrenaline of going to calls for service. But everywhere else, I was just shut down. Yeah. I had nothing, man. I was going to work with an empty tank of gas every day. And about once every two months, another thing came down that just demoralized me further. And another thing came down that demoralized me further. And then, you know, last or in 2021, after I'd been back to work for about two years and the harassment and the bullying kept going, as soon as I got back to work, man, it was right back. I had an annual review and my supervisor and I had a very candid conversation and she knew full well that I had mental health problems and that I was slogging through them and I was trying hard to get myself past them, but I was taking a sick day here, taking a mental health day there, you know, not necessarily pulling my weight all the time because I was, it, it wasn't sink or swim for me, man. It was sinking. I was drowning. And she approached a higher ranking member asking for some support. And that ranking member said to tell me to go get another job. <laughs> oh, wow. I don't even know what to fucking say to that too. I mean, you're saying things that I don't even know what to fucking respond to. It's like, that is the ultimate fucking terror for members who really need to speak up. Yeah. So to say it's been demoralizing, a bit of an understatement. And I know, you know, what's really nice about this, Larry, is I'm talking to somebody who gets it because you're in it and you're living it and right. you're experiencing the emotions and you're experiencing the somatic sensations that run through your body and you're experiencing what it's like to live in something that perpetually feels like hell. And yet everybody at the detachment thinks that I'm on vacation. <laughs> yeah. Everybody at the detachment thinks I'm lazy and I'm weak and that I don't want to do the job anymore. And I'm tired of being in trouble. You know, they all have their opinion and their thought about why I'm off work. And you know, as well as I do, that this is no vacation, dude. Oh, fuck no. This isn't yeah. a walk on the beach. This isn't a day off. This is every day I have to do things so that a day is okay. Yep. It's dark. Yep. It is dark. It's exhausting. And it is not a vacation. No, fuck no. I have to, it's actually the opposite. I have to stay busy and I'm sure it's the same with you because like there's no moment. I can't, I don't have a moment of relaxation. I can't, I can't, that to me is fucking horrifying because if I'm not doing something, then I'm thinking. And if I'm thinking, I'm not thinking good things. I'm thinking a lot of shit and the anxiety goes up. The fucking sadness comes on. And the breathing gets irregular. Start fucking freaking out a bit. Start, well, you, you just get triggered. I mean, I'm triggered by just the ability to fucking think. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, here we are with the podcast. So the podcast, I mean, yeah, it's it's also therapeutic to me because it gives me something to do. And like you just said a second ago, talking to people who are going through similar struggles and it's that ability, the unfortunate ability to connect 
because this is so fucking shitty. It absolutely sucks. It's meant to be therapeutic to other people who are also struggling, but doing so in silence. The ones that you, as described, are going to work just on adrenaline that are yep. contemplating some terrible fucking thoughts because they just, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to get out of it. You need the job. I need financial support. I don't want to be ostracized at work. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, it's tough. It's fucking tough and it's fucking horrible. And ultimately I understand completely where you're coming from. The need to stay busy. Yep. Jason, let's get to the present time. So you're still off of work, obviously. Yep. How are you managing, man? How are you? Like the days, like we just said, are horrible at times, good sometimes. For those who also, you know, I really strongly suggest you follow Jason on Instagram because he does a bit and he'll talk to you for a few minutes and he's got a hashtag called talking to horses and will actually give you a daily insight into the fact that he is not on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the plug, uh, Larry. Yeah. Talking to horses, this video blog that I started, it's a very organic and natural thing that occurred. And I'll get to that in a little bit. You asked me how I'm doing and what's going on lately. I'd love to talk about that because this is kind of like the brighter side of PTSD. This is like the hopeful side of PTSD. It's not just, don't get me wrong, Larry, you know, as well as I do PTSD. I, I say hell all the time. I say hell a lot because it kind of feels like that, you know, it feels as dark a place to get as possible short of shutting your own light off. Uh, yeah, I've been off work for 14 months. I left work at the end of November in 2021. I had a very debilitating anxiety attack at work. It was one of those things where I got myself to a side road. I was working in a rural area of our zone coverage, and I got myself to a side road, and I sat there wondering if I was capable of driving myself back to the police station. I managed to get there. I got my gear off, and I knew it was over for me. I knew that I only had a couple of options and one of them was going to be eventually I was going to go somewhere way too dark and I had already experienced this once so I at least had a little bit of wherewithal that I had to put the brakes on so I've been off work for about 14 months I have been struggling for a long time I'd say that my emotional struggles began around 2010 when this whole tattoo bullshit started up because there was a lot of stress in that. And I was still trying at that time. I was really still trying to make something in my career. So there has been this big up and down. It's been like a roller coaster ride of crests and troughs. But now as I've moved forward and I'm in this recovery mode, yeah, things are, uh, things are looking okay, man. You know, I have good days now. I have days where I'm pretty absent from any negative feelings. I have some of those days. I have a lot of days where I get really stuck in my head and I have this positive feedback loop of negative talk. And I, I bet you you do this too. And I bet you a lot of people would say the same thing who have PTSD or complex PTSD. I have conversations in my head all the time about situations that I've been in or situations that I could have been in or negative, angry conversations that I'd like to have with people who have hurt me. That catches me off guard sometimes where I'll be, you know, running around my farm doing some chores and thinking I'm just mindlessly going about my day. And then I recognize that for an hour, I've been having this super negative talk, this feedback loop of anger and resentment that just bubbles forward in me. And I don't even realize I'm completely out of control until I catch myself. And then suddenly I notice that I'm angry or I'm feeling uptight and anxious. And I'm not even anywhere where I should feel that, you know, it's, these subconscious mechanisms that are triggered I, and oh, dude, I hate that word trigger, but it's the only word we have to describe the mechanism that causes us to fall forward into negativity. But I get triggered sometimes somehow and I'll just fall into myself in this sadness in this dark place where I really have to claw to get back out to a level where I can go about my day. So I have been working hard for the last 14 months. I use psychological therapy. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Paul Johnston at Thunder Bay Psychology because he's one of my heroes. I call him a friend and I call him a mentor and I call him a therapist because we just, we've developed a really awesome relationship and the therapy has been monumental in me getting to a point where I'm able to start doing other things to help myself. 
on top of therapy, I have had to completely change my diet. I have stopped drinking alcohol because alcohol for me immediately causes depression. One or two drinks, the next day or two, I'm absolutely fucked. I just can't do it anymore. And that sucks because I really enjoy it. And it's part, it was part of my social life. It's not that I'm against alcohol. It's just, it's against me in a big way. Yeah. One of the positive things that I have found through struggling with PTSD is that I've come to spirituality in a way that's really conducive to being helpful for me. I have developed my own spiritual and religious practice. Meditation is something that I have turned to that has been monumental and helping me find a peaceful place where my mind can rest in thoughtless contentment for a period of time, which is absolutely precious when your brain sort of feels like a chatterbox of never-ending noise. Being able to get down to a level of peace, it's a wonderful thing to feel. I don't know if you uh, meditate, Larry. Yeah, I've, I've tried, and I'm, I'm still hearing the noise, but I am continuing. I'm trying. and Yeah. You just, you just got to keep working on it, right? And it takes a long time. I mean, I think yeah. me from what I've learned, meditation is something you practice for the entire length of your life. It's not like you ever can just get so good at meditation, you don't have to try anymore. Right. And I think it means a little bit of different, it means different things for different people. But for me, uh, and I'm pretty new, I've only been meditating for about eight months. For me, meditation really lets me escape the negative self-talk. It lets me see my thoughts and I'm stealing this from an older philosopher, but it, I get to see my thoughts like clouds passing in the sky. Instead of them sticking to me and having a negative emotional bias, when I'm meditating, they just pass by me. And I just get to observe them without reacting emotionally. So meditation has been another key component. I've taken up the use of cold water immersion and cold water shower therapy to help with my mental and physical well-being. Well, I've always been a bit of a gym rat, so I've always been a runner and a weightlifter. So I'm finally back into that because I fell off of that for a while. I've, I've been able to lose a whole bunch of weight because I gained weight from eating. Eating was one of those things that I did as a comfort and as a, as a soothing mechanism for when I was really, really low. Yep. And I ballooned up. I was, you know, I'm a little guy. I'm only 5'7", but I was, I ballooned up to 235 pounds, Larry. I was yeah. I was pretty fat for a while and it wasn't healthy in any way. I no. wasn't gaining a bunch of muscle and big swollen, jacked up muscle head. I was, I was fat. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, I also understand that. Yes. Yeah. And working yeah. out does help. Food is comfort. Listen, man. Well, food is comfort. Al alcohol is fucking comfort. I mean, I, I've changed diet. I'm with you there. It helps I, the alcohol thing. I'm, it's, that's a fucking, I'm working on that. I mean, I'm, it, anyways, the exercise is a big deal though. Yeah, I agree with you because that really, what I find is that it makes me tired. And if I'm tired, then I'm not thinking because I'm tired. It just takes that little bit of an edge off. Yeah, yeah, it really does. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm some miserable hermit that hides under a blanket all day long. I still live a life. I still have to live a life, dude. I, you know, like we all have life responsibilities. I'm married. I owe a serious debt of obligation to somebody who I adore and love and who has supported me through all of this garbage. And, you know, I, I got to be so thankful for my wife because, oh man, I was not present for a long time, dude. Yep. I Sorry. I was gone, man. I was, I was gone from my children's life. I was gone from my marriage. I was out to lunch, incapable of really some of the more basic needs that my family needed from me. And, you know, as a man, especially as a man, I think my duty as a protector and as a caregiver and as a strong pillar for my family to rally around i wasn't that you know so i use that now as a strength tool i use that as a way to motivate myself to continue going because i don't ever want to get to that point where i was so dark and so lost that i was losing touch with the most precious people in my life that is the hell for me is i mean the pain is fucking horrible the depression is fucking horrible the anxiety is horrible but it's just being somewhere else. And I, yeah, I fucking hate that. I'm, I don't know where I am, but I'm not here. It's fucking hard. So you're just lost in the translation of life. You just end up sort of floating in a sadness that has no explanation. Anxiety that has no catalyst. Yep. You know, you're sitting in your bedroom. You're on the couch. You're sitting on the deck in the sunshine. And bam, you know, you're suddenly hit with this sorrow. And with this anguish and you're looking around like, what the hell? I'm in a good place, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 
yeah, the last 14 months I have really been working on getting myself to a point where I can be a good, working, able, loving, caring, passionate member of my family again. And I'm there. I'm there most of the time. I have really been able to pull myself up. I've had a ton of support around me. I can't thank my wife enough for being, excuse me, being so committed to our promise. And uh, I really hold that in high regard that I've had a successful marriage through some of the most tumultuous times of my life. And so I really, I cling to that. And it's a, it's a powerful motivator for me that I owe it to my wife to, excuse me, sorry. I owe it to my wife to become the best version of myself because she held on waiting for that to come back. Sorry. There's nothing to be sorry about. She deserves that. And so do my kids, you know, and I think you probably feel that way that we all, we're not who we could be and we're not our best selves. We are yep. walled in, in this protective shell, yep. screaming yep. to come out, you know, and that's what you do when you heal is you start to climb over the wall or you start to break down the barrier that's holding you back from performing and being the best who you could be. Yeah. Can you imagine, you mentioned earlier, the therapist in Thunder Bay. And now your wife and kids, I mean, can you imagine if you didn't have them? That's what fucking scares me is, again, when you talk about people who are struggling and don't have that, are struggling with this alone. Yeah. Without my wife, my daughters, my therapist, she's, she's, I just don't think I'm ever going to fucking talk to someone else outside of my family like I talk to her. And without them, yep, I am genuinely scared to even think of where I could be. So please pass along, yeah. Just, I guess, a hi to your wife and a thanks for looking out for my brother. Yeah, I will. I, I will. I will do that for sure. And, you know, I think this can bring us right to where we started and the reason why you're doing this podcast and the reason why we've got a guy like Mark Long who owns Cracked Armor, you know, creating a therapy place, a safe haven. We need to stop this from occurring anymore, Larry. We can't take this anymore. I mean, you can't. It's just comical. You go to your graduation ceremony and they hand you a fucking gun and a badge and they give you the authority over everybody else's security in your nation. And yet you don't have that security at the constable level. This has to change. I mean, I, I'm not asking for sympathy at this point. I'm not asking for anybody else to take responsibility for what I need to do for making myself better. I have the supports in place. I'm doing the work. I am getting better. I have a future plan. I know what I need to do. But this right here, what we're doing and what Mark Long is doing and what other officers that are involved in this change, this movement, and there is a movement, Larry. There is, there is a bunch of us like you and I that are having a voice finally that are out there in the public saying, we won't, we won't stand for this anymore. And I don't know why anybody else would. I don't know why after hearing what you and I have to say or listening to somebody else who has struggled, I don't know why anybody else couldn't change their mind and become a more kind, more compassionate, more inclusive comrade with their brothers and their sisters in law enforcement and in emergency services and in all other forms of industry and business that's out there. Because I hear from people that work in dental clinics and veterinary offices in commercial workplaces. This is just not isolated to the policing world where we don't take care of one another. This is sort of everywhere. It has kind of permeated society as a whole, and it's something that we all need to take care of. We all need to take care of each other way more. We need to get back to feeling like we are part of a community, and we need to all understand that we're all traumatized. We're all going through our own hell, and if we each just supported each other just a little bit, then maybe we don't have to wake up in the morning to another suicide. Maybe we won't have to wake up in the morning to another officer who's off sick and can't return to work because they're so mentally unwell and so broken. So this conversation seems to have come full circle that we're talking about all of the awful and the experience and what is going on and how toxic it is. And yet what we want is a positive workplace. We want to promote love and compassion and true alpha spirit within the ranks of these organizations so that we don't lose people anymore. I think we can all agree that none of us want this. Very, very well said. And ultimately, yeah, you're on the money. 
we need to support each other. We need to talk. This podcast, I, uh, I want it to blow up. I want this to be heard by as many people as possible. And you know, you know what else would be really cool? This is like totally on a tangent and a little bit crazy, but can you imagine if we could create a device, some sort of VR where you could put on the device, press play, and for about five minutes, you could psychologically feel what it's like to experience the lows of PTSD. Fuck. You know what? We couldn't do it. No. Because it itself would be too deleterious. I wouldn't want to wear it. Fuck that. I wouldn't want to put a headset on that made me feel like I have felt for five minutes. <laughs> I no. wouldn't want anybody. I wouldn't want my friends and family to experience that. But maybe that's the thing that would give at least somebody perspective like, oh, God, that's what they're going through. I don't want them to have any more pain in their life. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm going to end this off, Jason, by just saying that my father was a police officer for 30 years. So you know, I, I always just wanted to know, wanting to just understand. After about eight months, I wish I never knew. And that's what it comes down to is I just wish I never knew. And yeah. It, it just fucking scares you. That's it. It just scares you when you can actually see how fucking horrible people can be to each other. So the point I'm making is we need to be there for each other and not like that. We need to stand up for each other. We need to listen to each other. We need to promote talk. We need to, we just need to step the fuck out of the shadows and be okay with not being okay. And as much as that's a, a catchphrase, but people actually need to be okay with not being okay. It's totally fine. Yeah. 100%, man. It's totally fine. So anyone who, again, you want to take a look at Jason's Instagram. Uh, his first name is common spelling Jason. Last name is Sierra Oscar Bravo Kilo Oscar Whiskey India Charlie Zulu. Sobkowicz, give him a follow. It really will help. I quite enjoy the talking to horses. I really do. And it gets to, you get to know you better. And again, I, it reminds me that there are others that are feeling the same way. And, and it really does also uh, give me a hope that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I'm only, I've been off for maybe six or eight weeks. You're at the 14 month mark and you're really seeing some improvements. I've seen, I've seen a lot of improvements as well, but I've also seen that I can slip back pretty fucking easily. So brother, I'm, I'm very, very proud of you. I'm very, very happy to have had the opportunity to befriend you to talk i really appreciate your time and i wish you fucking absolutely nothing but the very best i have a funny feeling that our paths will cross down the road yeah i can see us meeting someday larry and i'm honored to have been able to cross paths with you and it's an exercise in humility when i can have my voice shared because i really am passionate about making a positive change and you said it just a second ago. And the truth is that the more voices that start shouting, the louder that we get. And it's a stupid, it's stupid. That, I mean, everybody knows that the more voices, the louder. But that's exactly what we need in order to push the needle forward and make this way better for everybody. We can't keep losing brothers and sisters because they're afraid. And it's not they're afraid to get help. It's not even the disease that kills them. It's the fear of dealing with the disease that kills them. Isn't that insane? It's true. PTSD doesn't kill you. It's the fact that you're too afraid to get help that kills you. When a person loses their battle with mental health in law enforcement and in emergency services, it wasn't the disease that killed them. It was that they couldn't either face it because of the societal pressure or they didn't have the support in place because of the culture we live in. So I'm honored to have been a guest on your show. I think what you're doing is incredible. I count you among my friends and I, I look forward to our paths crossing in person someday. And I look forward to being on your podcast again when I can disclose a little bit more juicy goods because I have a lot of information I can share someday, Larry. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be yeah. doing this again. I'm pretty sure. This man, yeah, thank you. and thank I, you. I do appreciate the plug. Talking to Horses, I, I did mention it quickly, and I know we're going to sign off here, but Talking to Horses was something like a therapy session for myself where I talk about me, I try to tell a cool story, I try to bring in some analogies about psychology, that I, and I'm an amateur, I don't know much, but I try to just bring it all together and make people think that maybe there's a solution and maybe this is a way we can look at it so that we can all better ourselves each day, hold on to hope, and step one foot in front of the other so that we can get better. Give it a follow. 
It'll do you good, everybody. It'll do you good. Thanks for your time for listening. I really appreciate you tuning into the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. My name is Larry Payton. I have your six. Please have mine. Don't go away. There's so much left to do, so many things I want to say, and I sing Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away.